Hey there, welcome to YouTube. If you are into poetry, if you are into literature, if you are into cultural history, then you've come to the right place. Cardboard Box Productions makes podcasts about all those things, so be sure to click the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so that you never miss a new episode. Obviously, we mostly make podcasts, so you can also go to anywhere you get your podcasts, if it's a, a place other than YouTube, uh, like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and you can subscribe to our podcast feeds there. All right, I hope you enjoy this episode. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Close Talking, the world's most popular poetry analysis podcast from Cardboard Box Productions Incorporated. I am co-host Jack Rossiter Munley, and with my good friend Connor McNamara Stratton, we read a poem, talk about the poem, and read the poem again. Before we get into today's selection, a quick note that if you like what we do here at Close Talking and have a spare minute of your time, it would mean the world to us if you would give the podcast a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Those ratings and reviews help boost us up the algorithm and find new listeners. And if you have suggestions for future episodes or comments on this one, you can send us an email at closetalkingpoetry at gmail.com. And you can also find us on social media. On Twitter, the show is at Close Talking. I am at Jack Rossiter Munn, and Connor is at Connor M. Stratton. On Instagram, the show is at Close Talking Poetry, and on Facebook, it's facebook.com slash close talking. We also have a website, closetalking.com, where you can find all the past episodes of the show, and Cardboard Box Productions has just launched a newsletter, Unboxed, and if you go to cardboardboxproductionsinc.com, you can subscribe for more behind-the-scenes stuff on Close Talking and all of the other literary and cultural history podcasts that Cardboard Box Productions makes. On with the show. Welcome to another episode of Close Talking. I am one of your co-hosts, Connor McNamara Stratton. And I am the other of your co-hosts, Jack Rossiter Munley. And today we have a poem from the United States Poet Laureate. I feel like it's been a travesty since that we haven't done that so far, given that we're all about poetry, but so it goes. Um, I'm your oversight. I'm glad that we can rectify it now. We're rectifying it now. This is our rectification. This is a poem called Notes on the Assemblage, and it's by Juan Felipe Herrera, and it's from uh, his book of poems that has the same title, Notes on the Assemblage. And it came out pretty recently, 2015. And he's a very prolific writer. And I just wanted to do a brief bio of him because I think he has a very interesting career and in life. In the late 60s, Juan Felipe Pereira became involved with the new spoken word and street teatro civil rights movement and read at and performed at schools prisons, farm worker camps, many, many college campuses. And he has sculpted many language-centered texts, and he won the National Book Critics Circle Award for Half of the World in Light, which was new and selected poems. I think that was around 2008. And I like this sentence a lot. At the heart of his work is the poet as technician of multiple registers advocate of multicultural voices, and, as Thich Nhat Hanh says, devotee of inner being, that is, tearing down the walls that separate us personally, culturally, and globally. Another yeah. biographical note on him is that he is actually the child of migrant workers. Yes. Uh, and that was a big part of his early life experience. What really changed his life is actually having the opportunity to go to college sort of interact with the world of ideas and then find his place as somebody who really valued language and, and finding a way to work with it. Yeah. Yeah. And he's the U.S.'s first uh, Latino poet laureate, or U.S. poet laureate. Okay. Notes on the assemblage. Use black and gray and speckled white construction paper. Use stripped, scraped, and perforated construction paper. Use found paper. 
Use cardboard, stripped, wet, and mashed. Overlay on old encyclopedias, sheets with images, something like Kentridge or Delmore Schwartz. Use soap to brush them. Draw with pencil and marker. Draw the soap and noodles some stones. Draw with pencil and marker for outline. 11 by 14 page sheet. Draw the muddy camp, the bus, the pier, the toilet line. Close-ups too. How we look at each other. What we have on our faces. You can cross thought through it. You can escape into it and out. Through its holes, its gases. Our faces have changed. Can we go back? You can't wash it off, but you can erase it. I have yeah. an initial question. Yes. What do you think is being assembled in this poem? All right, that's a great question. Well, part of it, I think, is referring to like assemblage art, which is based on a Google search after reading this poem specifically, I have figured out that assemblage <laughs> art is an art form, which seems to be essentially like three dimensional collage. So you'll have a sculpture or something that's made uh, from, you know, different materials, basically, or you'll have maybe something mostly two dimensional, like a drawing or something, but it's overlaid over, you know, a book like the reference, I don't know if it's technically assemblage, but I assume that he's thinking about it this way, is Kentridge refers to William Kentridge, who was a, a South, maybe still alive, but uh, he, is. South, he is, okay, South African artist. And one thing that he did, he took a Oxford dictionary and printed big, like a two pages from it and one big one page had big text that was like, this is the beginning or something like da da da. And then on the other page, you know, there's like a drawing of an old person walking. It's like a, a palimpsest in that way where there's, there's the surface is an already existing text and the art piece is both that existing text and what the artist has then put onto it. Probably and it's good to mention who Delmore Schwartz is as well. Yeah, he is, was a poet. He is no longer alive. <laughs> he was a poet in the early, mid 20th century. I, I think, think he, he died. died in the 40s. 50s. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. And was very big at the time and, and influenced a lot of people who we know today, Berryman, Creeley. I actually don't know what the connection Schwartz has in this particular instance. I couldn't find if he was known for any sort of strange, like found poetry assemblings. Not that I know of. One interesting connection between the two of them is that they're both Jewish. I don't know that there's much to that, but I do think it's interesting. Okay. Yeah, I don't know Delmore Schwartz very well. So that's kind of, I think, the first answer. The larger answer, there's I, two, two larger answers. One is that it's telling that this is the name of the name he chose for the book. Um, the book is broken into many sections. There's one that's about in 2014 in uh, Mexico at the um, Ayotzinapa school. 42 students were kidnapped. And so there's a series of poems and they're still missing. And so there's a section that are like odes to basically poets that he loves and was friends with in our past. There are poems about police brutality. There's also poems though that are about like Buddhism and Thich Nhat Hanh. There's a very strange poem that's called, but I was the one that saw it and then parentheses drone aftermath. And it's like just letters like you can't actually say it out loud it's like ak what ak limo no 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 limo, no, no, no like that's anyway there's like frastic things which is just to say it's it is an assemblage of very different types of poems that are not synthesized sort of like in a like a way that has continuity uh, but rather just placed in adjacency to each other. And furthermore, it's not an assemblage, it's notes on the assemblage. So it's already, it's an assembling of an assembling about it, right? And then I have a larger idea about it. 
it could be a long um, digression, but I, I read this poem and I found myself feeling very theoretical and I like it. I also I, have a big idea about this. So I can't wait to hear, to hear where you, uh, where you theorized. Okay. Lay it on me. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to, we'll see. It's going to be a mishmash. It's going to be, it on. A, be a butchering. It's going to be schematic. I'm, I'm ready. Gonna, I'm going to plagiarize some people. Probably I'm going to paraphrase. I'm going to, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to riffraff. Bring that um, theoretical thunder. Basically, a part of the question comes from, I'm like, I'm reading this and I'm like, why are we talking about construction paper? What's the point of this? Uh, why are we talking about drawing? Da, 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 da. I think then I think about something about in between ways of knowing or defining the self and just like ways of knowing generally. And I feel that there's like a lot of sort of theoretical ideas that have come up in literature over the course of the last century that have tried to present or intervene against sort of like the dominant ways of like self formation or knowledge formation or something. I say this not to just like theory broski out, but it's like a thing that I think is important because popular things and things that are mainstream and common always have assumptions about how we know things or form selves. So like as an example, in politics and like the last election, politicians' arguments, you know, make America great again. And the counterpoint to that, you know, like we like saying, you know, we are a nation of immigrants. Stronger or together. With stronger Hillary together. together. <laughs> there you go. Stronger Thanks. together. <laughs> That's great. I think it's also telling that it's like no one knows that, but that's yeah, a whole other digression about is, a lot of yeah. other bullshit. But anyway, oh, stronger man. together. Stronger together. Those sorts of arguments sort of assume an essential America, basically, or that America is is something that exists and has an origin. Um, and you know, Trump's argument is a, a was a nostalgic call to some imaginary country that we're all part of, although not imaginary in his eyes or something. And similarly, though, here's where I think it gets interesting when you when you talk about when people critique him and it's like, for his xenophobia and racism, which is totally right, by saying we are a nation of immigrants or something, which is like, also, right. Um, it's still both of those are assuming like that they're that we are of a nation or that like we can know what america is and that it is something that exists outside of our constructed blah 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 type thing and similarly to use another different example when we watch like uh, superhero movies, like, for example, perhaps Wonder Woman, which I haven't yet seen, but I oh, hope to let soon. I assure you in the strongest possible way that it is very good. All and right. If you want a theoretical tangent with <laughs> a little bit of name dropping, uh, <coughs> Soren Kierkegaard, <laughs> uh, I yeah. can give that to you anytime you want. Oh, wow. All right. Well, I will be asking for that another time shortly. But the premise of the superhero story and a lot of you know quest stories have to do with or like the origin story of a person and that sort of has an assumption that a person has a kind of essential maybe cohesive identity um that is told and and formed through a cohesive continuous narrative that there's a uh, inciting incident that ruins everything and then through their struggle with their qualities you know they resolve and get the things that they want and that demonstrates you know their fundamental quality like uh, person or something um and you know other versions of this are you know just like more religious ideas that we have souls or like essential being anyway all that's to say is even if you're not into like Deleuze or Foucault, which I haven't read in many years. So this is why it's a, a butchering mishmash. 
It's um, called Fuck Alt, Connor. <laughs> God. There's still basically when when you engage in a political argument or you make your your vote based on a, a resonant political campaign, you know, you're you're buying into some sort of some sort of assumption about how you know things and how things come to be, basically, or things have and acquire their identities. And so I think that as a then a, an even worse schematic of of literature and art is since you know modernism onward and probably before there's been a various attempts to articulate our alternate ways of knowing and alternate sort of ways of conceiving the self so there's like modernism often is talked about and this and by modernism i'm loosely referring to literary modernism which is like joyce and wolf and stein there's the alienated self so instead of person who's in society and knows themselves and acts according to who they are they find themselves seeing themselves as and being distanced or alienated from that because of the world that they live in. Or people who are inspired by Freud have, there's an idea of the unconscious or you know subconscious that are producing motivations that are not rational or something, and that affects da 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 Then you go into postmodern or something, and you know there's a fragmented self. So you no longer have something alienated or continuous, but you're just a bunch of pieces which sort of brings me to, I think, Pereira's notes on the assemblage, which I feel like the assemblage for Herrera in this poem is, is one of these alternate ways of knowing or forming of a self, which is to say you assemble through construction paper or through it's a gritty collage of found stuffs basically. And I think that important to bring it in conversation, at least for me, into those larger theoretical things, because it goes, it makes arguments like what America is or isn't. It totally changes the terms of the argument, I think, in a way that's really helpful. You know, there's a common critique of even saying that we're a nation of immigrants, like as a critique of Trump by being like, we're also like a nation of genocide or like founded on slavery. And, and there's lots of incoherent parts of American history that don't make any sense. American as opposed to United States of America, like there's North America and South America. Canada is in America. Yeah. Mexico is in America, Brazil, and there's Central America, Honduras and Ecuador and Peru and Argentina. These are all American countries, why are we the ones who get to be America? I mean, like, yes. we said so, and you know, fuck you. But that's yeah. another like complicating idea. Make America great again. All right, which yeah. America? <laughs> what country are we talking about? Which state? Which people in which state? Like, and so yeah, exactly. And and I found it Herrera's assemblage, which which I think is, you know, it's obviously he's he's borrowing that word from. A an art tradition, but he's he's using that to, I think, propose an alternate way of being. The part of the poem, I think, that is kind of like the real, in some ways, thesis-ish, which is also marked out by the way that it's indented, is close-ups to then how we look at each other, what we have on our faces. You can cross thought through it. You can escape into it and out through its holes, its gases. And then the end has our faces have changed. But there's a way that through this sort of assemblage of the cardboard, the construction paper, you can get to the thought that is on the paper. And also that it's located on the face. So like there's a depth to the surface of the body, which is also not constant, which is why the face changed at the end. Uh, so that's anyway that there's more to that and it, it, it will probably become uh, hopefully it'll become more clear as we talk more about the poem specifically but I wanted to bring up that larger idea because I think the poem initially it's like why the fuck are we talking about construction paper and what does that have to do with anything and so it to me it gets at a sort of a literalization of a metaphor 
for knowing and forming. I like it. I went, I think, in a similar, but not quite as philosophical direction. I think I went in a more individual, personal direction uh, with many of the same kinds of ideas and thoughts. Um, what got me onto my, I'll just quickly give what my bigger idea reading is. It started because I was reading about Kentridge. The name sounded familiar. I definitely did not know him specifically, but looking into him, he has these projects where he makes animated films by erasing and changing the same drawing for each scene. So he'll make a drawing and then he'll, it's an animated film. And what he does is he changes the drawing with little erasing and redrawing as he does it. And so that got me thinking about the last line, which I thought really threw back onto the poem, a lot of ideas that weren't necessarily there as you read through it the first time. And the last two lines are, you can't wash it off, but you can erase it. And particularly with this idea of assemblage art as being art that really does have whatever was there before in the background with something new written on top of it, but they're both there. And the fact that both of the artists he calls out are Jewish, the fact that he is Latino, really had me thinking about how race and cultural identity operate in the United States. And because he does call out the different types of materials at the beginning, the different colors, black, gray, and white speckled construction paper, the idea that in American identity making, you start with all of these different cultures, all of these different heritages and races, and that in the process of creating American identity, you scrape off parts of them, you draw new parts on top, whether the person who is of that minority identity wants it or not, they find their culture changed. And because of their race and how they present to the world with their face, there is that section about faces because he can never change the fact that he's Latino. There's the great line, I think it was Dave Chappelle when he did his intro to Saturday Night Live saying that the difference between Black Lives Matter and Blue Lives Matter is that he's not in a uniform, he can't retire from being black. Whereas if you're a police officer, even if you feel threatened, you can always leave the police force. You know, you can't change the color of your skin. You can't change that. But what that means can be erased from you. Your culture can be completely removed and something new written on top. And so I think part of the notes on assemblage is these notes about how minority groups in America find their sort of essential culture, the initial, what they bring to the nation changed and reformed both by themselves and by forces beyond their control. What got me thinking about that too, is at the beginning with all the construction paper and the wetness, it had me think about how you make paper mache, which you'd often use to make a pinata. And because he's Latino, that had a certain kind of resonance in my thinking in terms of a cultural symbol that is widely and regularly just appropriated and yeah. the history of which completely falls away. But anyway, that, that's, that was my little, little riff, little riff thought. <laughs> no, that's great. Yeah, I think I probably like that one better than mine. But we're just assembling thoughts. No one wins. There's no one thought. Da -da 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 -da. There's countless thoughts. Thanks to another theory, all about death of the author. We can think whatever we want, and we can be equally right. We can be as right as Juan Felipe Herrera because he wrote the poem, and now everybody can bring their interpretation to it. I feel so right right now. I'll have to you say, should, because you I are. Say that. Yes. I love that you're talking about that last two lines because that's like very – not such a good reading of it because it, initially it's a very small distinction. It's like you can't – wash it off but you can erase it often i'm using wash and erase fairly synonymously yeah and i and i like thinking about the the use of soap uh in the beginning feels important for the end as a sort of specific detail so there's something like kentridge or delmer schwartz use soap to brush them draw with pencil and marker draw the soap and noodles some stones. Soap there actually, A is drawn. We are at one point making our own soap or an image of soap. And then we're also using soap, which we usually think of as the washing off part as a way to make the image. That makes the, the last distinction sort of more precise. 
I think, literally. One thing that I also really like, and this has a similar formal uh, parallel with the I-74 poem by the one and only Charlie Rosser, where in that poem, there was this the break between like our first and second section, the way we talked about it, where it was new life is born uh, at the truck stop, like maybe because of the line break and the lack of punctuation, maybe new life is born is ending something, but maybe it's bleeding into the truck stop. And at the end, how we look at each other, what we have on our faces, you can cross thought through it, which is a lo- line that I love. I want to talk more about it. You can escape into it and out through its holes, its gases, our faces have changed. And that part, our faces, is both the end of through its holes, its gases, our faces. So it it feels like we can escape through holes and gases and faces, but then it's actually our faces have changed. Can we go back? Uh, and so it's actually beginning, but the way that there's no there's no punctuation, and our faces has um, its own line. That's like a great poetry move because it's a way of starting your turn of thought without the reader knowing it until you've already turned. And so you're turning before the reader's turning, and then suddenly they're like turned ninety degrees but you've been turning 45 degrees for two lines and they're just like, whoop. And I love that little move there. So the poem itself has an assemblage quality. There's like the repetition of use, use, use at the beginning, use black and gray, da, da, da. And so it's just a list of instructions that have the effect of not um, developing into one thing, but just an accumulation or an assembling of various notes of using this paper, that paper, da da da. That allows that part at the end through its holes, its gases, our faces have changed when finally there is more of an explicit sentence that's continuing through lines that allows a shift to happen and that be more surprising, I think. I particularly like that you called out the our faces line because our faces is aligned to itself as you're describing that line that is on its own could easily be a part of the line on either side of it, but it's not. And the importance given to our faces in the poem, and it's even called out a little bit before that, where it says close-ups to how we look at each other, what we have on our faces, you can cross thought through it. To return and specifically put our faces on its own line Similar to the last line throwing back to the rest of the poem, that being on its own line throws you back to where he mentioned our faces before and really doubles down on how important the faces are in this poem. Yeah, and I love after the parts about the material and the 11 by 14 sheet, he says, draw the muddy camp, the bus, the pier, the toilet line, close-ups to. And so he seems, you know, the muddy camp and the toilet line you know, these are in in a similar way to, again, Charlie Rossiter's truck stop. You know, these are not, you know, we're not at the MoMA. We're not at Yale. You are at the toilet line, you know, and these are the close up faces that he's interested in. I just, so I love this line. You can cross thought through it. Each part of the word for a little bit has a little part that's similar to the last word and then it changes it. So like, uh, you can cross, so can and cross have the C's, and then cross and thought. So we've dropped the C, but we get the ah, and then thought through it. We drop the ah, and then we get the TH. I don't know. And then I'm like, what's it exactly? Because that was my question. Yeah. What, what do you think the thought is crossing through? Is it crossing through these faces? Well, it's like what, it's like the what that we have on our faces, right? It seems like it. Yeah, but then it is like, what do we have on our faces? (laughs) Right, part of it to me, because it is not that you are crossing through the faces, you're crossing through what is on the faces. And at least from my reading of the poem, what's on the faces is all of the different social assumptions and ideas that get put on someone because of their race. And that's what's on your face. Your face is a color, all of the cultural overlay is what's on it. And you can cross thought through that. 
Mm. You can think your way through those assumptions. You can either accept or disregard them. Yeah, I think that's a right way to read it. For some reason, I don't know if I have a basis for this, but I just keep thinking it's also like a, it's just the weathering of life. And like, there's just a personal history that you can see on someone's face. Oh, that's very good. Yeah, and that, that assembles on the face. What What's interesting about both of those two readings of ours is they come from, I think they're both there, but they're very different like subject positions or something. Yours is kind of, there's a person stereotyping someone um, and who's maybe in a position of power who's white or something and is making assumptions. And the one that I proposed is anyone who's maybe is in the toilet line too, but is just like paying attention to their fellow person or something. Um, right. And is maybe less powerful or equally powerful or maybe more powerful too, or you know, whatever. But I do think he's interested in both of those things. But can we go back is an interesting moment because that's talking about bringing in the you and the I into a we, and it feels like the we are people who are sort of of relative equal stature in that moment or something. I think I would draw the difference slightly different. I think I'm looking at like a historical or social subject and you're looking at a personal subject. Because I'm not necessarily thinking that it's a disparity in power or even a disparity in race. It's just that someone looking at another person, what's on their face is whatever their race brings to it. So maybe it is someone of lesser power looking at someone of more power, people of equal power recognizing what society has placed in front of them and you know either accepting or disregarding as they do it. And you're looking at two people sort of recognizing the humanity in each other. It's a fascinating poem. It uh, is. If yeah. for no other reason than that it draws out in very simple language this interest in ideas that are clearly of great depth. Right, right. Because it's not, I mean, we've looked at poems that have much more complex theoretical type language in them. This sort of decidedly does not. I think the biggest word in it is encyclopedia, and most people know what that is. It's right. not like it's using complicated words or specifically calling out any of these theories or cultural or philosophical. It's not calling out theoreticians of culture. It's not calling out philosophers. It's just using simple language, real world scenarios to bring them to the forefront yeah. and to yeah. invite you into a conversation about what that sort of implies for you as an individual and in some ways for the country as well. Yeah, that's exactly right. Going off of that is the reason why you and me get the movement from the first part of the poem, which is just descriptions of materials to use, and then the shift close-ups to this meditation on our faces changing, crossing thought through it, much more abstract in the attempt to make the poem a more cohesive thing, we have to bridge the materials in the beginning, just the physical materials with the abstract faces language, though both are simple language there, they're operating on different levels. And I think that attempt at least forced me to reach for some larger theoretical thing, even though you're absolutely right that there's no Foucault name dropping. No, it's not explicitly in the poem, but it's hard not to see the poem calling out to that kind of a reading or yeah. really explicitly engaging with the same questions that people like Foucault or other equally dense theorists are also yeah. interested in. I really need to read Foucault again so I can properly mention him because I, well, anyway. <laughs> I really just haven't been dropping in uh, enough theories in my <laughs> life lately, so I just need to like... No, it's not that. I just... Oh. It's fun to do, and I feel very irresponsible, but at the same time, maybe that's more fun. As Horkheimer and Adorno would say, that sounds dank AF. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. That's all you gotta do, just misattribute your quotes. Just be like, you know, as Lee Iacocca would say, that's a great idea. <laughs> There is that uh, John Oliver bit about quotes being attributed on the internet to random people. 
Like, yes. Well, that was when they did the the fucking goddamn mother shitting Lincoln quote that made no fucking sense <laughs> and wasn't even from fucking Abraham Lincoln, but because the goddamn president doesn't believe in facts. Yeah. And is a well, rampant yeah. fucking bullshit machine. And that whole thing about Trump saying, like, in 1990-something, that oh. if he would run for any party, it would be the Republican Party because they're dumb. He didn't. He just didn't say that. He probably Internet thinks that. Goddamn ding dongs. So it's wild. I'll probably. I should be more responsible. Facts are real, but they at the are. same time, poems are great and real. Welcome to the desert of the real. That's a book by Slavoj Žižek. What Ooh. name drop theorist? Uh. All right. Let's let's let's, uh, let's hear the poem again. Let's hear the poem again. Notes on the assemblage. Use black and gray and speckled white construction paper. Use stripped, scraped, and perforated construction paper. Use found paper. Use cardboard, stripped, wet, and mashed. Overlay on old encyclopedias, sheets with images. Something like Kentridge or Delmore Schwartz. Use soap to brush them. Draw with pencil and marker. Draw the soap and noodles some stones. Draw with pencil and marker for outline. 11 by 14 page sheet. Draw the muddy camp, the bus, the pier, the toilet line, close-ups too. How we look at each other, what we have on our faces. You can cross thought through it. You can escape into it and out, through its holes, its gases. Our faces have changed. Can we go back? You can't wash it off, but you can erase it. This is co-host Jack Rossiter Munley. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, head on over to Apple Podcasts. Leave a review. Five stars, maybe? Those reviews help with the algorithm and are a great way for us to find new listeners. And you can put anything in them. You can write whatever you want. You can just say, oh, this is a good podcast. I like this podcast. You could be like, hey, that Connor guy, he makes a lot of good points. Uh, Jack, why is he doing this outro so long? You know, get him off the mic. And whatever you feel like writing, head on over there. Five stars drop in the review. Uh, Do you have thoughts about this poem? Is there a poem or poet you'd like us to cover on a future episode? Well, we'd love to hear from you. And there are tons of ways that you can get in touch with us. I mean, I guess you could drop it into an iTunes review. You could be like five stars. Hey, why don't you talk about insert name of poet here? Um, But you can also send us an email. That's probably the best way to do it. Close talking poetry at gmail.com is our email address. Or you can find us on Twitter. I am at Jack Rossiter Munn. Connor is at Connor M. Stratton. And the show is at Close Talking. On Instagram, you can find us there too. Uh, We are at Close Talking Poetry. And we are on Facebook at facebook.com slash close talking. We haven't gotten to TikTok yet. And we might never. Who knows? Anything is anything is possible. Um, speaking of all those social media platforms, a very special thank you to our incredible social media manager, Corey China, who keeps us active across the internet. And a thank you to all of you for listening. We will see you next time.